Uh, I have here a couple of little details just because I was interested in seeing what the scenes were at the bottom of the crucifixion picture, those little squares at the bottom. And they basically refer to events that were supposed to take place during the crucifixion. According to the Bible, uh, there was an earthquake and the veil of the temple of Jerusalem was rent or torn. And there in the, the lower right, as we look at it, uh, you can see uh, this architecture, the little arch, and a torn curtain. So that is the uh, veil of the temple torn. The other side I thought was really kind of interesting, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but you do see these two, uh, we see what looks like a stylized mountain and some people behind it, and then uh, two little grave openings, uh, miniature sarcophagi or something, but uh, two little grave openings uh, with two people coming out of them. Now, it's curious to me that they've got halos on their heads. Um, I'm not quite sure how to interpret that. Um, according to the Bible, during this earthquake, the graves opened. In other words, um, you know, the, the ground was uh, broken up and the, the graves opened. Um, but in this artwork, it looks like they've gone a little further. The, the actual dead seem to be alive as they're coming out of the graves. It seems to be a kind of resurrection scene. And so, and this is just me, you know, interpreting visually, uh, but I kind of wonder if it is have a, a deeper meaning, a kind of double meaning. Uh, that it refers both to the opening of the graves at the time of the crucifixion, but also uh, to the end of time. The last judgment is supposed to occur, uh, but also to the resurrection of the body at the end of time. Supposedly, there will be a last, uh, supposedly everyone will come back to life. Uh, souls will be reunited with their body, and then there will be the last judgment and those who are not already in heaven and hell will find their eternal resting place, those who are in purgatory, um, will be sent one way or the other. So I'm curious about this little scene, and uh, I can't quite read the inscription, but could it have a, a kind of double meaning? Well, that's speculation. And we're allowed to speculate. Um, now let's look at the scene of St. Erhard celebrating Mass. So St. Erhard is the priest uh, who will be celebrating, officiating at the Mass. Uh, the Mass, uh, we have a lot of a lot of names for it, uh, the communion service, uh, the sacrifice of the bread and wine, the Holy Sacrament, um, the, uh, the Eucharist. And this is uh, the main sacrament in the Christian church, or certainly one of the main sacraments. It's the one that is uh, repeated. Every priest must say mass at least once a day. So there are uh, masses going on pretty much all, all the time. Um, and as we said, uh, masses reenact the crucifixion of Christ. Now, who is St. Earhart? St. Erhart is the founder and the patron saint of the Niedermünster convent. And when Bishop Wolfgard, he is not the bishop at the time the Uta Codex was created, he's a slightly earlier bishop uh, at the time when they decided to reform the convent. And so, Bush, uh, so Bishop Wolfgang had a vision of St. Erhart appearing to him and calling for the reform of the convent. And so this gave uh, additional authority. I mean, you might think a bishop has plenty of authority. Uh, if a bishop or anybody else, as we'll see later, if a, if a nun, if anyone uh, can say, well, the saint told me to, or God told me to, I mean, that's like the ultimate authority, isn't it? So, you know, Earhart wants the convent to be re reformed. And uh, here he is uh, after the reformation of the uh, convent. Uh, in this beautiful service book. What we're looking at is uh, St. Earhart in the middle. We'll take a closer look at him. Uh, there's this wonderful arcing canopy uh, over uh, the saint and the altar. And you see canopies like this in uh, the um, Carolingian uh, Codex Aris of Charles the Bald, which was at St. Emmeron at this time in the 11th century. 
Uh, so you see these in Carolingian, on Antonian, uh, and other manuscripts. So this is the baldachin or canopy uh, over the altar. On one side of the saint, we see a uh, deacon uh, or a sub-minister at the Mass, uh, someone who will be assisting him at the Mass. On the other side, we see the altar. We're going to take a closer look at the altar. And you can see that directly above the saint, we have a roundel, um, a round shape, that contains uh, the image of the Lamb of God. And of course, the words Agnes Dei. And we'll take a closer look at that and what's going on at the top as well. Let's look at some of the details. Here is Saint Earhart. He's a frontal figure. Uh, by a frontal figure, we mean a figure who is standing, um, facing directly at the viewer. And his front shows. Uh, and his head and his eyes are turned just slightly uh, toward the altar and toward Christ on the cross. His pose is kind of interesting, too, where his hands are placed. Uh, it reminds us of the orant pose or the praying pose uh, of the uplifted arms, of, uh, of the uplifted hands uh, that goes back to paintings in the catacombs. So it's a prayerful gesture. Uh, but many of those have the hands, uh, the, but many of those have the arms raised higher. And in this case, we can see that the hands are coming uh, sort of directly out of the center of his torso, That's sort of straight across. The body forms a kind of cross shape. So what is happening is that the saint is imitating the pose of Christ on the cross. As Christ uh, is on the cross with his arms outstretched. So the priest, who is the celebrant at the Mass, the saint, uh, is in the same pose, a vertical figure uh, with hands outstretched on either side. So this is a good way to show that the saint is imitating Christ, uh, that the, the, uh, he is following Christ in the sense uh, that the Mass will reenact the crucifixion. And it also suggests the idea of prayer and of intercession. Prayer, because this can be a prayer gesture, and also because the nuns would be praying to their patron saint, Saint Earhart, and then Saint Earhart would intercede for them by taking their prayers directly uh, to Christ. One of the things that I wanted to remind you of, it has to do with the style of these manuscripts. None of these manuscripts are going to look naturalistic or illusionistic. They're not going to look like they're three-dimensional, solid. Uh, the space isn't going to be laid out with linear perspective. And they shouldn't. All that comes much, much later. Linear perspective, for example, in the 15th century. More naturalistic images um, begin um, in a later century. The next century, actually. but. Um, yeah, you know, that's just the beginnings. So at this time, uh, we would expect to see some. This is an incredibly uh, high quality image. Uh, the shading of the face, uh, the detail uh, that you see here is just uh, it just very very well done. And. I just wanted to caution people because every once in a while I have a student who assumes that art should be uh, imitate three-dimensional reality. Uh, remember that these are images that are showing a spiritual reality. And there's a long history, uh, not only in the Western world, but even in uh, some other cultures, of using abstract images to represent uh, something spiritual, something that is not material. Uh, the more abstract image better reflects that immaterial realm of spirituality. At least, that's one of the ideas. Let's look at the detail of St. Earhart's altar. There are various liturgical objects on this altar. Okay. Let's look at the detail of St. Earhart's altar. On it, there are liturgical objects which we're going to discuss. Uh, and then at the bottom, you see uh, this sort of crenellated wall and um, architectural uh, images. 
I'm not quite sure what the architecture is. Is it supposed to be a, a walled city, or could it be, and this makes a certain amount of sense to me, that it could be the walled convent, just you know, walled off the world. So the convent that St. Earhart founded. We can't be sure, but you know, that's a possible suggestion. Okay, we'll look up above that, uh, and let's look at the different objects here that are associated with the altar. Uh, you can see the chalice, the large cup that would have held uh, the wine of the Eucharist. And you can see this round golden thing next to it. That is the paten, or the plate on which the host or the bread would be placed. Over to the left, there is a large book, a liturgical book, that is uh, sort of angled upward. And we're going to talk about what that book might be. Uh, certainly, it's some kind of liturgical book. We see two votive crowns. And I'll also show you exactly what a votive crown is. Uh, but uh, they're hanging. One is hanging from the uh, archway. And the other is uh, hanging, a very small one, uh, right, over the, uh, right over the chalice, uh, is hanging from this portable altar, or chiborium, or tabernacle. And we'll talk more about that, too. Now, if you look uh, down, you can see these uh, images that are sort of in roundels that are pictures of winged horses. And these are patterns that you would find on some of the very, very rich woven silk uh, that would come from Persia or from Byzantium. And I went on the web uh, to see if I could find anything, and I did find a couple of examples. Uh, they're not the same century, but they're very similar. So pre-Islamic Persia or Byzantium both produced these very, very fine uh, silk fabrics. And one of the patterns that they often use were the winged horses. So you see here one that has a winged horses, uh, the actual uh, scrap of the fabric. It's uh, black horses with golden wings as opposed to the white horses, uh, but similar. And, uh, and the other example, we have uh, horses. They aren't winged, uh, but they're facing each other, uh, rather like the altar cloth that we see hanging from St. Earhart's altar. Now, it seems quite likely that that design isn't just something they made up, that there probably was a beautiful, rich altar cloth in either St. Emmeron or the Niedermünster Abbey or convent. I have a couple of other actual objects to show you in comparison. Um, I mentioned votive crowns, and uh, here is in the lower right of your uh, screen, uh, there is an actual votive crown. This is probably the most famous votive crown. It's much earlier. It's from the seventh century, Visigothic Spain. It's the crown of Recuswelth. Uh, we know that because uh, his name is spelled out in letters that hang down from the crown itself. And as you can see, this is golden or gilded. Uh, with the uh, polished jewels, uh, it, it creating designs on it. Um, and these would be given to churches, to altars, uh, hung above the altar uh, as what, additional decoration. And the name votive crown, they might be given to the church um, because of a vow. Uh, perhaps the king, or whoever gave this, um, has uh, prayed for something and has his prayer answered, or he's promised he will give this. Uh, so it, it becomes liturgical decoration. They're, they're not crowns to be worn. They're to be hung and to adorn the altar. The other image that you see in the Uta Codex here is just fascinating, because you'll notice the actual object. I found this uh, little image on the web. Uh, the actual object that you're seeing below uh, is a specific chiborium or tabernacle. Uh, it's the Arnulf chiborium, uh, which would serve as either a portable altar, you could put the host in here, uh, or a kind of tabernacle for the host. And we know when that was donated to St. Emmeron. This is part of the treasury of St. Emmeron. And if you look at the image in the codex, and then you look at the actual object, they're the same. Oh, there's a few little differences. And of course, uh, the uh, the um, image in the codex is flattened, uh, but they are so close that it, and, and we know that this chiborium uh, was in St. Emmeron. So it seems quite likely 
uh, that there's a reference to the actual treasures that the emperor Arnulf, Arnulf uh, in the late 10th century, donated to the monastery at St. Emmerich, which raises another possibility. We keep mentioning the Codex Aurus of Charles the Bald or the Codex Aurus of St. Emmerich. And this is the cover of it. You can see one of these uh, golden book covers uh, adorned with jewels. This and the Arnulf Triborium and other liturgical vessels, which we don't necessarily uh, know which ones, uh, but these two are part of the donation of Arnulf to the monastery at St. Emmerich. Uh, and so it has been suggested that if, if that's the Arnulf Triborium, maybe the book that's portrayed in the Uda Codex on the altar, maybe that is this book, the actual Codex Aurus, which would be a great treasure that the monastery would own. Well, of course, these two things make another connection with the monastery at St. Emmerich and may indeed um, you know, strengthen the idea that a monk or monks uh, in the uh, monastery created the manuscript of the, the Uta Codex. On the other hand, St. Erhard is the saint, the patron saint of Niedermunster. So certainly there's the, the close connection with the, um, the convent. Now we're going to look at the top of the uh, page that has the mass of St. Erhard in. And uh, the inscriptions over the uh, little square scenes on the side with the two figures in them. Uh, you can see the, the reading here, which translates as uh, Unica Pietatis Affectus, love of piety alone. So this tells the nuns essentially what they're supposed to be doing. You know, they are supposed to be completely dedicated uh, to their vows, uh, to their life of prayer and piety. And in the other uh, little square, the one on our right, uh, it says very clearly, Dona Abatissa, Lady Abbas. And so this is another little picture of Uta. And here she's, she's identified as the Abbas. And uh, she's uh, looking down at the mass. Of course, the, the, uh, the sisters would, uh, would uh, have uh, canical hours that they would say eight times a day. And they would also, of course, go to mass. Uh, so she's uh, expressing her devotion uh, to the mass, uh, to the saint, uh, to the uh, rituals of the church, and uh, to the virtues. And there is a titulus, or inscription, that goes around the entire image. And uh, it seems to uh, be the words of the Lamb of God, the Agnus Dei, which is right in that uh, circular form in the center. We'll take a closer look at that. But here's what the titulus says. The ruler of ewes, in other words, female sheep, <laughs> uh, that's symbolic, I, Christ the Lamb, address you in order that whenever appropriate you may strive after those virtues so that neither piety nor the rule will be complete so that neither piety nor the rule be completely revoked so it's as though Christ himself is reminding the yous who are the nuns you know sort of uh, if Christ is a lamb uh, they are, they are the brides of Christ, so he's, he's giving them this, this sort of symbolic name. Uh, he's reminding the nuns that they must strive after virtue, they must strive after piety, and that they must preserve the rule. And the abbess is there because that is her duty, that is her obligation to make sure that the rule is followed and that the virtues are enforced. Now, we're going to look a little closer here at the Agnus Dei. And you can see very, very clear inscription. You have a cross and the word Agnes, lamb or sheep, Dei of God, and another cross. Now, the Agnes Dei is a symbol of Christ as a sacrificial victim of uh, the host on the altar. Uh, the words are in the liturgy of the Mass, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. They are also 
uh, the original use of the words the Agnus Dei and applying it to Christ is from John the Baptist. When he sees Christ, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And then the church combines this with the other words, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because the Lamb was a sacrificial animal and Christ is sacrificed on the cross. Now, we also find a lamb in the Apocalypse, or the book of Revelation, the last book of the Christian Bible, uh, which is uh, St. John, the evangelist's vision of God and of the end of the world. And in it, uh, symbolically, a lamb on the throne um, opens seven seals and then destruction is raided on mankind and everybody gets killed. Um, so here we see the lamb not perhaps opening a seal, but with a, with a book. And there's another inscription around there. It says, uh, spons sponsus, spouse, uh, verganus, uh, verganum, um, the spouse of virgins. So the, the uh, nuns are the brides of Christ, so Christ is their spouse or their bridegroom. Um, I have another little picture at the bottom, which I took from uh, a picture of this manuscript we keep, this Carolingian manuscript we keep talking about, uh, the Codex Aris. It has uh, a wonderful picture of the apocalypse and the 24 elders of the apocalypse throwing their crowns uh, before uh, the Crystal Sea. And up at the top, there is this roundel of the Lamb of God, a very stylized lamb, as you can see. Uh, in his case, he's got a scroll rather than a book. Um, but you can kind of see, in a way, he's the granddaddy, <laughs> uh, maybe the inspiration, uh, certainly some influence there, perhaps, uh, for our Agnes Dei and Uta Codex. Uh, the Mass of St. Earhart uh, has a strong meaning for the nuns. The liturgy, uh, the Mass, brings the nuns closer to God their patron saint will intercede for their saints. The sacrifice of Christ, which we see on the cross on the one page and on the altar on this page, brings eternal life to the faithful. And we saw the abbess up there in the corner sort of watching over everything. Well, that's her duty. She's supposed to watch over her nuns um, and she is responsible for them. Now, there are also, I think I said, that there are four pages with the pictures of the evangelists, the writers of the four Gospels, the uh, four first books of the Christian New Testament that tell the story of the life of Christ, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, I'm not going to try to show you all of those, um, but here is an example. This is St. John the Evangelist uh, with his symbol, which is the eagle. Now, one thing I should mention to you, we call this the Uta Codex, which just means the Book of Uta. Uh, sometimes you could call it the Uta Gospels. That's not exactly true. Uh, what it is is an evangelary, or a book that contains uh, the parts of the Gospel that would be used in the services. So it's a service book. It doesn't have the entire Gospel, but it has the readings that the priest would need uh, when he's saying the Mass.